project is not so much a research project as it is a discussion of a project that I, is ongoing for me right now. I'm currently working on producing a vaudeville show with my peers this semester. I'll be producing it, acting in it, uh, helping with literally all of the elements of it, actually, uh, playing in the band for it. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk to you about what I've learned from it. Um, first off, who here knows about vaudeville? Okay. <laughs> That's kind of what I thought. Um, I'll give a brief history at the beginning of Vaudeville so that everyone is kind of on an even playing field here. Uh, the reason I chose to do this project is because I am a saxophonist and I'm very, very interested in uh, the foundations of saxophone playing in America. And in an interview with Benet Henton of a uh, saxophone soloist with the John Philip Sousa band, um, he said that a man could go into a shop on Thursday and buy a saxophone and by Saturday be making three cents a night on the vaudeville stage. <laughs> uh, I thought that was pretty funny. So there, it was a little bit lower expectations of performance actually in vaudeville uh, rather than up on like the big opera stage where they would do really big shows. But vaudeville was more a sense of um, optimism and high energy. Uh, it was during the time of the Civil War. so. Uh, it's kind of counteracting all those negative forces in America at the time. Uh, vaudeville started with, uh, Dr. Taylor can probably say this better than I can, but uh, Olivier Vasselin, uh, who is considered the grandfather of vaudeville. Uh, he lived in the 14th and 15th century, and he was born in the Valley of the Fire in France. Uh, he was a workman, composer, and singer, uh, and he was highly sought after for his songs, actually. Um, since the area that he lived in was called the Valley of the Fire, uh, people began to shorten that to Val de Fire. Uh, and later on, in the time of Louis the Sixteenth, uh, they changed it to a UX, I guess to be fancy. Uh, it, to, it turned into Vaudeville, uh, which at that time applied to any popular songs uh, that were sung in Paris. Um, so it, it really wasn't even structure at this point. It was all just songs were considered uh, And then eventually it was uh, changed to Vaudeville, uh, and these were performances by the aristocracy of France, and then they dropped the X, and until today it has been called Vaudeville. Uh, like I said, it was originally just a collection of songs, and eventually they added acrobatic feats, magicians, uh, humor, lots of comedy, acting, uh, big playlists that could last 15 to 20 minutes uh, that were actually very structured. But at the very beginning, it was just a collection of songs and then it progressed from there. Uh, it was a variety show. It had no dramatic sequence uh, whatsoever. So uh, it could be the kind of thing like now for something completely different. And <laughs> it could be a sad playlist followed by a humorous two act. Uh, by two individuals. Um, Vaudeville came to America before 1820, but it was just before the Civil War that it became uh, immensely popular. And as I mentioned before, this was during a time when there were a lot of negative forces acting on uh, America. And the optimism and happy nature of this form of entertainment kind of uplifted everybody. Uh, and it at first only appealed to men, as there were lots of girls dancing involved and a lot of time early on, it involved lots of crude humor uh, and slapstick comedy and people hitting each other over the head. Uh, but this all changed in 1865 with Tony Pastor when he invented clean vaudeville. Uh, he understood that it was an entertainment industry and he needed it to apply to all uh, consumers. So he took away all the crude words and actions as well as the drinking bar and theaters. Uh, and this, he was able to draw women and children into the crowds uh, to make it more of a family show, and he made a lot of money doing this. Uh, he eventually moved up to Broadway, and everyone always had plans to go see uh, the Tony Pastor's vaudeville show. Um, and in 1885, it was not uncommon for continuous vaudeville to occur, in which the theater would be open from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., and there were at least two performances a day. 
when I was thinking about what I needed to do for my Vaudeville show, uh, there were lots of things that I had to take into account uh, that were kind of obstacles that I had to overcome. Uh, the first one, and possibly the largest one, was finding the proper location. Uh, my optimal location would have been the Black Box Theater over in Breckenridge. It has operating curtains, lights, um, it's a decent size, space for speaking at people um, and them hearing it properly. Um, however, there's so much going on in the Black Box Theater uh, and schedule conflicts arose, uh, so I moved on to my next option, which would have been an outdoor venue, just somewhere around campus. Um, and the good thing about this is that there would be virtually unlimited seating um, <laughs> and standing room, I suppose. Uh, and the bad things are that it would reliant on weather, and there would be unreliable acoustics for the music and acting. Uh, I'm not sure everything would translate to the audience very well. Um, what I eventually decided upon was Fulbright Rehearsal Hall, uh, room 117 in Fair. Um, this room has a raised stage. It actually used to be used for uh, concerts, and there is a some sort of sort of curtain on the stage. <laughs> it's in a uh, rather unpleasant condition, but we're working to figure out how to make it close all the way. Um, it does have a pit in front, which is where I plan to place the musicians, uh, which is rather convenient. And it's, it's kind of homey, I suppose, as well. It's, it's uh, a well-lit room. You can control the different lights on the ceiling. I hope to uh, incorporate that in my show. Um, I'll have to create a backdrop to suspend either paper or fabric from the ceiling behind the curtain. Um, and a typical vaudeville show, there will be a space called one in the front of the stage, and then a bigger space called two, and then an even bigger space called three. Uh, for my show, I will have room for one only. <laughs> uh, but I'm doing smaller acts, which will not require as much space. Uh, I need scenery. I plan to borrow props and costumes from the prop shop and the costume shop in Breckenridge from the theater department. Um, the props will be appropriate to the acts in which they're used. So there will be a street scene in which one of the two acts will be performed. And there will also be a parlor scene, which is kind of like a living room. They used to, in that time, have the parlor room where they would go smoke and things like that. Um, and the costumes, it's probably going to be somewhat gray suit galore. I'm, I'm all set with mine, but I'd love to get everybody theirs as well. Um, and the lights will not be as abundant as in a typical vaudeville show. I don't have the resources necessary for that. There would be stage lights and different colored lights on the stage to create different effects, as well as uh, floor lights around the seats and things like that. Um, I plan to try to get a spotlight uh, for my actors, and I also mentioned the ceiling lights. Uh, my favorite part of the show is the music. Um, we need accompaniment for the singers during the uh, acts, and we also need transitional music between acts so that uh, the stage crew can change this uh, setting and we'll have time to get everyone prepared and whatnot. Um, so all of my music will be performed by a vaudeville style saxophone quartet, um, which has a very nice, energetic, just like vaudeville, it's very optimistic, energetic feeling, very happy ragtime type music. Um, and I actually got one of my friends who is aspiring to be a composer to transcribe and arrange the piano music of the acts for saxophone quartet, which uh, I think will work out very, very well. And for the transitional music, I've got uh, three different tunes from the six Brown brothers, who were a very, very popular vaudeville sextet um, in the early 1900s. Probably the most important thing that I need is actual acts. Uh, I, I wanted to have about 30 minutes of acting material. A typical vaudeville show could go anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, but I had I knew that with my resources and time, uh, I had to do a condensed version. Um, so my show will feature three different two acts as well as a, a dumb act at the beginning. I call it a dumb act because it does not require the audience's immediate attention. Uh, they would allow for people to still be coming in at the last minute, getting in their seats, rustling around. 
Um, so my first act will be a musical act uh, of myself playing a solo by Rudy Lee. I'll get to that later. Um, and then I'll have a flirtation act between a man and a woman. A musical comedy two act that's very, very dry humor. Um, and a comedy two act with dialogue. And there's no singing in that one. Um, and two of the scripts I transcribed from Vitaphone's short videos uh, on YouTube uh, that were just uh, available. Um, and that was kind of difficult because as, they, as the actors spoke, I had to listen very carefully to make sure that I was getting the right words written down. Um, and it, it's kind of a different language back then. They had different slang, and I had to make sure that I was interpreting it all perfectly as well. Uh, and the last one, the comedy two act, the dialogue, uh, I found that in the book, Writing for Vaudeville by Brett Page, which actually, that book is mostly what I use to supplement this book. The typical order of a vaudeville show uh, has nine total acts. Uh, the first act, as I mentioned, is a dumb act. The second act can be anything. Uh, it's typically a flirtation act, which I'm happy to say that my second act is a flirtation act. So I'm staying accurate with that. Uh, the third act is more of a wake up to get the audience rowdy. Uh, the fourth act is a big punch with big name stars. The vaudeville writers would always have uh, big stars come in to be in their shows that would pull a big crowd. Uh, and the fifth act would be the best act before intermission. They wanted to get either the biggest laugh or the most tears or the biggest smile uh, with the fifth act before intermission. Um, for my show, uh, I'm doing a condensed one. Uh, I'm doing the Rudy Weop solo as my first act. And then Weedoff was a popular vaudeville and recording saxophonist in the 1900s. Also helped start the saxophone craze in the U.S., uh, which is where hundreds of thousands of saxophones were bought within like 10 years. Um, my second act is a flirtation act. It's Lamb Chops by Burns and Allen, a, uh, a married couple who did vaudeville. Um, and that was one of the Vitaphone short videos that I found. Uh, it involves some humor and some singing, and I'll be acting in that one as well. third act, the musical comedy two act, is the wake up, per se, it'll get the audience laughing, hopefully rolling. Uh, and that will be followed by a humorous tune as well, it's called Laughing Sax by the Six Brown Brothers, in which the soprano sax uh, makes, imitates a laughing sound on the saxophone, and it was not uncommon in that time for saxophonists of vaudeville to do different fun sound effects, hiccups, laughs, sneezes, things like that. Uh, and for my final act, uh, it's the longest one, and that's the one that I got out of the book, and that one will present a great challenge to me, as I have to do the staging and the blocking, and I really get to have the most fun with it, actually. I get to do really whatever I want with it, which is really fun. <laughs> uh, things to consider while planning this project uh, were the schedule conflicts. As I there's always things going on on campus uh, that prevented me from having the spaces that I needed at the times that I wanted them. Uh, having to schedule rehearsals with actors, I've had to depend on them rehearsing it on their own a lot because I am not always around to be there. Um, I had to consider the authenticity of it. Um, I want all of my actors to have appropriate dialects of that time period uh, because I think that it, the show wouldn't necessarily have the same effect without the costumes and staging of actors and with that I'm asking help from theater student friends that I've made. Um, there were challenges for each individual act. I had to transcribe the scripts. A challenge for me would be acting and singing um, and then as I mentioned before creating the act with only a script available. Uh, the other thing that was a challenge for me was understanding the language as I mentioned before. Uh, not only the language of the scripts, but stage language. Um, the Olio, one, two, three, the spaces on the stage, all of the different uh, elements of the vaudeville stage. Uh, what I've learned through this project is that producing something alone is virtually impossible, and by that I mean producing a production. Um, and I had to divvy up the work, I had someone else transcribe the music for me, um, I have help from theater students, 
much about vaudeville and it's very optimistic uh, energy. Uh, I've learned that vaudeville is like the YouTube of the early 1900s <laughs> as everyone would go to it as a form of entertainment where they could see whatever they want. They would usually see a lot of different things. Um, and I'm really, really hoping that my show will be well received because I'd like to keep putting on shows like this. And I think that it's something that can be appreciated by everyone still today. And it's Thank you very much, Todd. <laughs>